Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan and today we are going to finish up part six of Lighting for Photography Flash. In the first half of part six we talked about the history of flash, the science of flash, we compared studio flash with speed lights, and we talked a little bit about the power of flash. In this second part, we're gonna look at flash duration, synchronization, TTL, the on-camera flash. We'll also look at modifiers, macro. I'll give you some tips on buying and uh, even a couple of tips on how to use flash. But first, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters and those of you supporting me through the website. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you so much. If you're interested in becoming like those people, there's a link right here that you can follow. I just went outside to see what the end of the world rumbling was, and it's uh, the people have come to take my trees away. It's quite impressive. about something that is very much associated with the power output of flash, and that is the duration of flash, because this is important. The power of the flash tells us how well we can throw light into dark scenes. But I told you there were two other things that flash can do. One is to freeze motion, the other is to control contrast. In order to freeze motion, our flash needs to be of a suitably short duration. It's very important when we talk about flash uh, duration that we understand that in many respects, the flash duration supersedes our shutter speed. If you're in a dark environment, the duration of the flash provided it's shorter than the, uh, the, than the shutter speed itself, creates a new shutter speed, an effective shutter speed. So that if I have my camera set at one two hundredth of a second, but I have my flash set at one four hundredth of a second, then it doesn't matter what I set my, my camera at because the, the uh, sensor is only gonna be exposed for the one four hundredth of a second that the light is being produced. There are two conventions that are used for measuring the duration of flash so that you can compare one uh, product to another. And they are the T.1 time and the T.5 time. And it's very important that you understand the difference and you know what number it is you're looking at when you're trying to figure out the flash duration of, of a particular device. The T.1 time is actually time 0.1. It is the time in which 90% of the flash is finished and only 10% of the flash remains. So it's when the flash is almost completely over. That's the T.1. That's the important number. Now, People who are selling flashes will, would much rather show you the T.5. The T.5 is how much time passes until half of the energy has been dissipated by the flash, which is much faster, three times faster usually than the T1. So if you look at a flash that has a duration, a T.5 of uh, one four thousandth of a second, uh, and you try to freeze action at one four thousandth of a second, you'll be very disappointed because the flash uh, is going to be lighting your scene much longer than that and you'll get motion blur. So you need to understand that the, the, the uh, T.1 flash or the T.1 flash is much more uh, likely to correspond to the actual results that you're gonna get. The number is always gonna be longer, obviously. I mean, you're waiting till 90% of the flash is gone. It's still gonna be 
it's still going to be fairly quick, but you need to use the T.1 so that you don't have extra light that's uh, illuminating beyond what you need to freeze the action, or you won't freeze the action. Hand in hand with, with the duration of flash is how we synchronize our flash and our camera. And to understand synchronization, we really need to understand what happens when your shutter opens and closes. I'm going to use this very expensive simulation demonstration to show you how a shutter works. Uh, most shutters, most focal plane shutters in most cameras work something like this. You have two curtains, they're called, two different leaflets of shutter, both of which are capable of covering the sensor, and they travel independently. So when you press the shutter button, the first thing that happens is the, the front curtain, or the first curtain, moves out of the way of the, the uh, sensor. And depending on your camera, this will have uh, a different speed. In my Nikon D850, that travel takes 2.4 milliseconds for that leaflet to be out of the way of the, the sensor. The sensor is exposed then until my shutter speed reaches its end when the rear curtain or the second curtain flips up to cover the shutter again. So that's the, what a shutter actuation does, opens and then closes the shutter, just like that. Uh, so when you press the button, it opens. After the shutter speed has ended, it'll close. Now, at half a second or a tenth of a second, that's no big deal. Uh, your flash, if, you, if you're shooting at one tenth of a second, uh, you've got plenty of time uh, for the sensor to be exposed, for your flash to go off and capture the image. But as your shutter speed gets faster and faster, you get to the point where there isn't enough time for one to get out of the way and the second one to wait. And what happens is the first uh, curtain of the shutter will start to rise and then the second will follow it up to the top. So at a very high shutter speed, when the first curtain begins and the second one follows on its tail, what you'll notice is at no point is the entire sensor exposed, meaning that when your flash fires, you're only going to see that strip of the sensor that is not covered by shutter. And that is why the synchronization speed is so important. Take again my D850. It takes 2.4 milliseconds for the, uh, for the uh, front curtain to get out of the way of the sensor. It also takes one millisecond for the flash to fire. That's a total of 3.4 milliseconds, which is the, exactly the same as one 290th of a second. Meaning if we shoot any higher than one 290th of a second, we will never get the, the sensor fully exposed. So the sync speed is basically the fastest shutter speed that you can have that is going to allow the sensor to be fully exposed. Now, I just said for, for the D850, it was one 290th of a second, but we also actually have to build in a very short delay. Uh, as, the, as the first curtain lifts out of the way of the uh, sensor, it fires the flash when it has completely finished its travel. So it would be flash right when it gets to the top. The flash happens there. And we have to build in that tiny delay, which is why for the D850, the flash sync speed is 1 250th of a second. So that's why we have sync speeds. They vary from like 1 150th of a second up to about 1 250th of a second in a, in a uh, good quality DSLR. Medium format, for example, have even slower shutter speeds, mainly because the sensor is so much bigger, the leaflets have to travel farther, and the whole mechanism is heavier. It just it, it mechanically takes longer to happen.
So to summarize that concept, the sync speed is simply the amount of time it takes your, your uh, shutter leaflet to travel, the duration of the flash itself, plus any triggering delays that are built in. Uh, but that's what that, that number means and it's very important you be aware of, of yours. Associated with this is another concept I'm sure you've heard of, high-speed sync. It's something that some flash units can do and it allows you to take a photograph at a much higher shutter speed uh, than would otherwise be allowed by the, uh, the way the, the shutter operates. The way high-speed sync works is very different. What happens is the flash delivers the power in a number of smaller flashes or less intense flashes over a very short period of time. So what you have is a very rapid burst of flashes. It happens so fast, it looks to you like one flash, but it's actually individual flashes that are occurring as that gap between the, the curtains of the shutter are passing over the sensor. The problem with that is you're reducing the power of the flash very significantly when you use high-speed sync. It can be as much as uh, two-thirds of the power gets eaten up in the process of, of doing the high-speed sync, so you have to uh, allow for that. Let me interrupt myself real quickly because otherwise I'll forget to bring this up, but somebody is going to ask about the built-in flash. How does that compare to these other devices and What's that used for? Basically, it's used for nothing. Uh, it's terrible. Um, the only reason a built-in flash can be handy is to trigger other flashes, in my opinion. The problem is, of course, with a built-in flash, your light is in line with your lens. It's dead on. It's never flattering. <laughs> it has a tendency to cause terrible red eye. You know, if you're in a dark situation and your pupils dilate and somebody points a flash and presses the button, all of that light goes right into your eyes and lights up the bloody mess that is your retina. And uh, you get just a nice photograph of your retina lit by flash and you with a startled look on your face. It, there are ways you can modify an on-camera flash, but the flash is very low power. Uh, it's really, I, honestly, I can't think of a single reason why I would ever use it. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you can put some kind of a card in there to flash it up off the ceiling, maybe use it as a, uh, as a bounce card, uh, may, maybe that would be okay. But uh, the, the, you know, the, the power is so low, it probably would get lost in the distance. Which reminds me to bring up a very important concept. It, whenever we're talking about light, and I know we've talked about this a lot before, but it's, it's also an issue with flash, is we cannot forget uh, the relationship between the uh, power of the light, the intensity of the light, and the distance to our subject. It's the inverse square law once again. Remember that when you half the distance to your subject with your flash, you actually increase the light intensity by uh, four times. If you increase the distance between the flash and your subject, so it's twice as far away, it's four times less bright by the time it get, gets there. And that's simply because the photons are traveling out in three-dimensional space. So by the time you get twice as far away, you've got four times as much space to spread those photons into. What it really means in a practical sense is relatively small changes in flash to subject distance can yield really significant differences in the amount of illumination. Where that becomes really critical is in macro, for example, where a tiny distance in the position of your, your individual flash units can have a profound difference on the amount of light that's getting to your subject. One other word about the on-camera flash. It does, it does tell us something important. If a flash that is positioned right on the camera in line with the lens produces horrible photographs, maybe we should think about using flash not on the camera. And that is 
a really critical concept. We'll talk about it more in a minute, but it's how Flash becomes such a powerful creative tool. I don't mean to imply that there aren't times that it would be really convenient to have your, your Flash mounted on or near your camera. Uh, especially a, a good example is if you're outdoors shooting macro and you don't have, you know, three people helping you and you can't set up off camera flash. There are plenty of ways that we can do it. It can be as simple as uh, using a little bracket like this that, that slides on the hot shoe and allows me to angle the light a little bit. Uh, we can also have a flash on the camera and bounce the light off the ceiling. Uh, devices like this uh, are available. This is just a, a camera bracket that, that holds the camera and allows me to position the flash way up uh, and out of the, the line of sight. And this device will even allow you to flip the arm over in the other direction so that you can move the flash both off the, the uh, camera and way off to the side. So there are plenty of ways that you can stay in close contact with your flash, uh, yet still not be shooting in line with your lens. Let's talk just for a minute about through the lens metering and manual control of your flash. Most of the time when I'm using flash, I'm using it in a pretty controlled environment. If I'm using it indoors, especially when I'm using it in the studio, I have all my flashes manually set to give me the effect that I want. I really have no use for TTL, but there are a couple of times when the way TTL works is helpful. Let's say I was shooting something that is moving and it, it, one minute it's close in, the next minute it's 10 feet further away. Now I could manually adjust my flash to anticipate where the subject's going to be, but TTL can do that for you in a small fraction of the time because what TTL does is the flash sends out an initial flash, a, sm a small burst of light, and then gathers the information that bounces back and uses that information to set the intensity of the main flash, which happens instantly thereafter. So if I'm using a flash uh, in a situation where the subject I'm trying to shoot is, uh, is constantly moving towards and away from me, let's say I was photographing a bar ballerina who was prancing all over the place, and I could never get the, the, the light right manually because she's moving too fast and half the time she's in the air. TTL would help in that setting in so far as for every shot, every time I pressed the, the shutter button, the flash would figure out the distance and set the power accordingly. And then if you're going to use TTL, your camera also gives you control over exposure compensation. So if your shots are consistently a little bit too dark, you can bump up the exposure compensation to make up for that and still use the TTL. But I don't, I don't think I've ever shot a ballerina, to be honest. I don't think I've ever seen one. That's interesting, except in photographs that were taken with TTL. But uh, yeah. 99.9% .9 of the time, I am controlling all the light anyway. So I set it the way I want it and I don't rely on the, the TTL. Using TTL can also lead to problems with exposure. Uh, and that is a, a result of light objects tend to cause uh, underexposure of the, the photograph if you're leaving it up to the technology to, to set it for you. Likewise, a dark subject will cause overexposure of the whole scene. Remember that your camera is trying to expose for 18% gray. Using flash indoors and using flash outdoors are two very different concepts. Now by indoors, I really mean using flash in the studio. When the flash is going to be the only light, you have unlimited control over the position, the direction, the intensity, 
the way you can modify it. And yeah, you, you have, you have complete control. When you're shooting outdoors, you're really using flash for a different purpose. Really what you're doing is using the flash to decrease the contrast so that you can narrow the dynamic range of your scene. For example, if it's a bright day and you're photographing a model against a bright background, if you take the photograph just like that, the camera is going to expose for all of that light and your model is going to be uh, basically a silhouette. But if you can provide some light, but not too much, what you can do is light the, the uh, subject while slightly darkening the surroundings so that you compress the dynamic range. And that's what I mean by using flash to control the contrast. And it's something that the outdoor uh, model photographers use all the time. Uh, and there's a real there's a real technique to using it. Now it used to be that the only way you could do this was with with speed lights, uh, because studio lights were just too bulky. But now, as studio lights are much lighter, much more compact, they're using new battery technology, so the long lasting batteries are much smaller. You are much more likely to see people outdoors using these compact studio lights to overpower the sun because they can pump out enough light, enough energy to really wrestle the brightest of backgrounds and, and dim them down while boosting the, the uh, shadowy area of your subject. Similarly, speed lights are getting more and more powerful. Uh, lights that, uh, that use... Uh, these lithium uh, power packs uh, can put out a great deal more light. I have a, a, a flash very similar to this that uses regular AA batteries, and it only has a guide number of like 48 or, or thereabouts. So the, uh, the, the ability to use the modern equipment is blurring the lines between having to use studio equipment and flash equipment when you're outside. Using flash outdoors, uh, using it as an effective fill light and getting the balance just right is an art. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to do well. Uh, if you do it well, you should have no clue that a flash was used. It should just basically level out the, the dynamic range and the flash should look very natural. It's very easy to use a bit too much power in that setting and have a rather obviously flash photograph. So one thing that I've tried to cover uh, in each of these uh, light source videos is the issue of uh, modification of the light. And yeah, you'll remember that modification of continuous lighting is really pretty hard to do well. Some of them are easier than others, but modifying really large diffuse light sources like big LED panels or even worse fluorescent lights it is a real challenge. Quite the opposite is true with flash where you can do virtually anything with modifiers. You can uh, use every modifier that's uh, ever been dreamt up will work with flash. You can uh, diffuse light uh, simply by uh, adding small or large diffusers uh, between your light and the subject. Remember that the bigger the distance between the source of your flash and your diffuser, the more effectively it will diffuse the light, the softer the light will be. Uh, bear in mind that uh, lights like the speed lights have a very directional light. Even when you diffuse it, it's still a very hard directional light and it's much harder to soften with a diffuser. But if you were to use a studio light, for example, um, and use no modifier on it at all, you get much closer to a ball of light and it's much easier to soften that. 
Other ways that you can modify flash include reflectors of every conceivable size and shape. I use postage stamp size reflectors in my macro work and in some product photography, but you can use gigantic sheets of foam board as well. Uh, bouncing light also spreads it out and softens it, so that's a, a very useful technique. All you have to do is use a black reflector instead of a white one or a gold one or a silver one, and all of a sudden you have a flag. And flags come in all different shapes and forms. This is a, a fairly standard barn door that is actually designed to go on this Einstein flash that I use. And it allows you to simply exclude the flash from certain parts of the scene by moving what are basically flags in the, in the stream of light. Another way that you can limit the spread of light is using a device like a snoot. A snoot will fit over the bulb in your flash. And it, because it is black and it's matte inside, uh, what will happen is it will absorb the light that isn't passing down the center of the device. People get confused and think that this actually concentrates the light. It does not concentrate the light. It just cuts out any light that, that cannot get through that central hole. It absorbs it. Another way that we can control light is uh, control flash is by using grids of various different descriptions. What this does is add directionality to the light. Light that is off axis and trying to spread out will get absorbed by the grid and only those columns of light that are parallel will remain and get through. So it gives a real uh, definition to the light. You really feel the direction. And they're not just small, they come in this size to fit on the front of a speed light. They also come in this type of arrangement to fit on the front of a soft box. A soft box, another good example of a diffuser. Uh, that can usually be fitted with one or two uh, pieces of diffusion material. The bigger your softbox, the softer the light, uh, partly because your light source is usually moved back from the diffusion panel, but also because it just has a larger area to diffuse over. On the other end of the spectrum are softboxes of this size which are something I particularly enjoy using in macro photography because they're small and compact. They don't soften like anything like a big softbox. Uh, the, the difference in size is quite small, uh, but they do take the edge off. And uh, they, some of these will also have a, 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 second, a second piece of diffusion material inside the box that you can put in front of the flash head to get a little bit more diffusion. How else can we, uh, how else can we manipulate the light with flash? We can concentrate it. Now, I am, I, I am working on a DIY focusable uh, light. Basically, it fits over a flash and allows me to focus the flash output uh, to a very fine uh, spot. Um, it's not going very well, but that's neither here nor there. That's one way you can do it. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to buy one, uh, the company Broncolor makes what's called a Pico light. And the Pico light has a, a, a focusable device that fits on the front of it, but each of them are $1,600. So it'd be $3,200 to have a little light that you can focus. I'm, mine will be cheaper. Of course, mine won't work, but you get the idea. Another way that you can concentrate light, very popular, is to use a beauty dish. A beauty dish has a, a reflective outer dish and a baffle that is reflective on the back, and uh, what happens is, this one I made for a, a speed light, the speed light will flash onto the back of this light colored baffle and bounce the light out into 
the, the parabola, which will put it forward in a fairly tight beam of light. These are fantastic uh, for portrait work as they allow you to get a real accent light, very directional uh, and not spreading out all over. So you can really, you know, you can aim your light beautifully with a beauty dish. And you can also put a diffusion panel over a beauty dish. Another option for diffusion is to use a scrim. And I have several big, big scrims that allow me to put a, a bare bulb flash behind it and create just a very soft, diffuse light. So there are no limits to what you can do with flash. And it's why uh, for me, it's pretty much my go-to lighting. It is so easy to modify, whether you're using big, hefty studio lights or half size flashes. One modification I didn't mention was using gels to change the color of the light. Uh, very easy, very quick to do. And it also can be used in macro photography, just like all the other uh, different uh, methods. So in the studio, flash gives you a level of control that you could only dream of getting with continuous light. And if you were getting it with continuous light, it would be a very hot studio because we can aim flash while keeping the, the studio cool. And by positioning lights, creatively, and, and if you do this for a while, you'll learn exactly how to get the certain looks you're interested in. Uh, but by the way you position your key light and your fill light, maybe a hair light, maybe a background light, there are so many things that you can do to emphasize particular features or types of face or types of person uh, to get particular effects. And uh, it's, it's really, an incredibly fun part of photography. I wish I, I wish I did more of it, uh, but creating unique looks in the studio just with how you position your flash uh, is great fun. I said I wasn't going to give any specific advice on how to use flash, but I am going to break that uh, little rule and, and make a couple of very general suggestions. If you're trying to build up a lighting effect, whether this is in a full-size studio, uh, to, to shoot a portrait, or if it's to shoot a bug in your macro cage, build up your lighting effect one light at a time. Understand what it is you're trying to get and create that look very methodically. It makes all the difference in the world. I guarantee you, you will get very frustrated if you try to throw all the lights together at once roughly what they looked like last time, and then you get a subtly different look that you don't like, you're not gonna have any idea why, because lights interact with one another, and it just is a, an easier process to slow it down and work with one light at a time. Another thing that I would suggest, and this is really important in macro too, is pay attention to the light, but pay as much attention to the not light or to the shadows. Shadows are every bit as important as light or the absence of light is, is every bit as important as the light itself. So when you're doing a multi-light setup on any scale that you're doing it, pay attention to what the unilluminated parts look like. Because oftentimes in portrait work, that's where the magic happens. Let me say one or two things about buying lighting equipment, flash lighting equipment. It is really important that you know what it is you want, know what it is you're trying to accomplish, and understand the pitfalls that are laid out there for us to fall in when we're spending a bunch of money on lighting. Probably the biggest uh, pitfall is believing the hype without checking out what you're being told. One of the ways that you can definitely get tripped up is uh, if you're, you're looking at a piece of equipment that quotes a, a flash duration of one ten thousandth of a second. If they don't tell you specifically what 
duration they're measuring, then you can just discard that uh, as, as unhelpful information. You need to know if that is the T.1 or the T.5 because they're totally different and they will radically change how you will use that flash. Also, understanding what the guide number means so that you can compare flash outputs between units quickly and accurately. It is so easy to get confused and thrown off by all the different numbers they offer. When uh, a flash advertises that it has high color consistency, you want to know exactly how high color consistency. The, uh, the Paul C. Buff has uh, a color consistency of plus or minus 50 Kelvin across the entire range. That's fantastic. Understand the difference between color temperature and color consistency. When a flash says it has a color a temperature of 5600K plus or minus 200, that plus or minus 200 is the color of the light at full power, so it can vary by that much. That's not color consistency. Color consistency is how does that color change as you increase or decrease the power, and that's important. As the various different types of flash devices, the studio lights and the, and the uh, portable lights get more and more like one another as the technology improves, it's a good idea to make sure that you know what you're buying. Remember, whichever kind of flash you're using, whether it's big studio lights or speed lights, if you're planning on using them off camera, which you certainly should plan on doing, that's where they really come into their own, you're going to need some kind of a flash trigger. This Godox trigger I've had for years, it's very reliable. It, it hasn't given me any problems, uh, 50 or $60. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of places will throw one of these in if you buy a couple of uh, speed lights. Third party speed lights versus uh, brand speed lights. Where that's important is if you want to rely a lot on TTL or on, on, on uh, a very coordinated activity between the camera and the flash then it would make sense to use a Nikon flash on a Nikon camera because they their creative lighting system is built to operate uh, with, with that technology. Where you run into problems with third-party flash is when you're trying to use uh, the, the creative flash suite. Not something I ever use, again, because I don't use TTL that much, but uh, yeah. Otherwise, there's no reason to, to get a flash with TTL if you're not planning on using it. The best example of that is if you're only needing flash to use in your macro cage, you don't need a flash this size. You, you can use a much, much smaller flash. Godox makes one half this size. Nikon, the SB200 is even smaller and uh, they're not that expensive. You can get several of them. You don't need TTL if you're not gonna be using it. If you're gonna be focused on, on uh, just uh, the macro cage, save your money and get smaller, lower power flashes and a decent trigger and you'll be set for life. One other thing, a different kind of speed light that's of great interest to us macro photographers are this type of speed light, which is a ring flash. Unlike the ring flash I showed you in the last video, which was basically just a ring of LEDs, this is actually a ring flash. It has two proper xenon tubes, curved tubes, one on each side that can be set independently. And uh, it's a pretty useful tool uh, if, if you like using ring flash. I had to build a big diffusion thing for this because the light from it is really pretty harsh. And I've kind of gotten away from using it because I've got better ways of diffusing my flash uh, that, that seem to, to give better images. Uh, but that's certainly another option you consider. Let me, let me say one word about LED flash. I showed you that device uh, in the other video, which was a ring light made of LEDs that would give a pulse of light uh, when you had it set on flash. 
That is not flash, and uh, it shouldn't be confused with flash. You're not going to get anything close to the durations uh, or the brightness that you need to freeze action. So where you see somebody uh, advertising a, a ring flash, an LED ring flash, it's not a flash. It's an LED ring light. Flash, to me, is the way to go. It is the most versatile, the most uh, adaptable, modifiable light you'll ever find. About the only thing that Flash doesn't give you is that very handy, what you see is what you get feature of shooting in continuous light. I will grant that you don't get that. And if you want a, a, a studio flash with a modeling light that is gonna give you some idea of what your, your end image is gonna look like, you'll spend a fortune on it. Most of them don't get above about 200, 250 watts of modeling light power. It doesn't really help you understand what your image is gonna look like unless you spend a fortune on something with a really high powered modeling light. Uh, that um, that gives you accurate color. If you're just getting into photography, it's probably worthwhile thinking a little bit about what your interests are and how you would use flash so that you can pick the right kind of device that won't just sit on the, the, the shelf gathering dust because you're not using it. So think about what you would use flash for and then make your purchases based on that. Understand what the numbers mean, the numbers we've been talking about today, uh, so that you can make apples to apples comparisons between devices and also understand what you're buying. But you know, like anything else in photography, the equipment is only one little part of the, the puzzle. Whatever you decide to go with, whatever kind of uh, lighting you decide to use, uh, the, the real uh, benefits are going to come when you, you learn how to use it well, which involves a lot of practice and a lot of patience. We have one more episode to go in the lighting series, and that's where I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about macro and give you uh, a kind of a summary of uh, my best practices for that. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. If you have any comments, leave them below. Check out the website uh, and the blog page if you want information on any of this equipment we talked about uh, today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again very soon. Take care. Goodbye.